Okay, mm-hmm. let's begin with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for uh, your abounding grace in our life. As we think about all of the, the problems and the headlines of this world, uh, it can be a bit troubling, to say the least. Uh, and yet, Lord, we know that you are a God of, of justice and that you ultimately do right all of the wrongs in this world. And uh, you do it, though, in a way that that many of us don't expect or many of us don't understand it. You do it through your son, Jesus, uh, who who took all of the the wrongs of this world upon himself and, and made us right through his own sacrifice. Help us, Lord, to be people who understand that great sacrifice and live from it and show grace and mercy through your act of of mercy and justice in Jesus. This is the only way, Lord, the only way that the, the world will be changed through the message of Jesus and his kingdom. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Okay, last week we spent a ton of time on was Jesus angry or was Jesus compassionate? And uh, again, at the end of the day, I honestly don't know what the original was. And I can see it in the story, both anger and compassion. You, again, see there obviously had to have been compassion because Jesus healed the man. If, if he had no compassion at all, there would be no healing. But it's in the second part of the story that we really haven't given full um uh, merit to where you can see the, the anger and that happens um, in, in a number of different ways. We said we could see anger in the fact that this man is is afflicted and, and Jesus does not necessarily need to be angry at this man, but can be angry at what sin has done in this world. Um, and, and so there's, there's obviously that part, but there's also um, that, that, Jesus is harumphing. Uh, Jesus just sort of sternly warning this man and whatever that meant um, because Jesus wanted to go to all of the different surrounding cities and villages and tell them about the, the, the good news of the kingdom. And if, if Jesus is overcrowded by people, um, they don't have a, a PA system. They don't have, you know, a mega food. So how, how can he get the word around? He has to do it little by little, little by little. But if he's overwhelmed by a ton of people, that actually could limit his ability um, to get to these to these different places. So we've seen that he says, it's my goal to preach the message. And if he can't preach the message because he's thronged by people, that that is a little bit of a problem. So you can understand why he tells this man just to, to kind of cool it. Um, so let's finish the story of the leper. Um, hopefully we don't have too much longer. If you have the handout, uh, if you need the handout, I have it. Mark 1, 40 through 45. Um, we're at this, the second part of the story. So he makes this, this leper clean. And it's verse 43. This is where the, the kind of change happens. It says, And Jesus sternly charged him and sent him away at once and said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded for a proof to him. But he went out and began to talk freely about it and to spread the news. And here's the result. So that Jesus could no longer openly enter a town, but was out in desolate places and people were coming to him from, from every quarter. So the end result of this man um, not listening to Jesus was, was not that he wasn't healed. That, that was already, it already happened. The, the healing was already accomplished. Um, but he was supposed to go to the priest, as was the law in Leviticus, and do things properly. So Jesus wasn't subverting the Old Testament laws. Um, In fact, this was supposed to be a a testimony, a proof to these priests. And actually what it would do is help the priests like see, what do you mean you're clean? What do you mean you're healed? How, How did this happen? Well, there's this guy named Jesus who was out there. And so this man would actually be an evangelist of sorts to the priests. And, and the priests would know, 
again, there's somebody greater than us out there. Um, priests were not healers. They did not have the, the healing uh, gift. All they were supposed to do was to keep these lepers away from everybody until they started to be better. And then the priests were the gatekeepers that would reintegrate them into society again and say, okay, yep, you, you no longer are afflicted with leprosy. Come back into society, make these sacrifices and offerings. And uh, those sacrifices were, you know, thanksgiving to God, but also um, part of the sacrifices were atonement for sin. Again, it, it was not necessarily that they were saying, uh, I got leprosy because I sinned, but sin exists and leprosy exists as a result of sin. And so it is that reminder that, that all sickness and all death come from sin. So it's not necessarily I sin and then God's like going to punish me and I, I get sick. But it is a, that much bigger picture of sickness wouldn't even be a part of our story unless sin is a part of the story. So when you're healed, that sacrifice of atonement is the reminder that sickness and death ultimately get traced back to, to sin, to Adam and Eve's disobedience. Because Jesus told many people mm -hmm. after healing them mm. don't say anything to anybody is that the reason why because he didn't want to get swamped when he went into a town it, or village or it, it, it's at least part of it so here that that seems to be the the greatest motiv motivating factor um it it also is people misunderstand who jesus is and what he's come to do the story gets changed a little bit well just that this this man is a great healer a healing man has come. Jesus did heal, but that wasn't why he came. That's not the message. Right. The, the kingdom of God would come through the cross. Yeah. He, he wasn't going, because these people that he heal, they're going to get sick and, and eventually they're going to die. So what good was that healing after all? It gave them a little respite, but it, it, doesn't, it doesn't solve the greater problem. And again, these Old Testament sacrifices we're to connect people's minds with what is the greater problem then. It's sin. So what's going to be the solution to sin? Well, Jesus would bring that. But before the cross, n nobody understands this. So he tells them to, to keep the message down because what they would be broadcasting was either the wrong message um, or the, an incomplete message. After Jesus' death and resurrection, go, tell all nations, because now you know the full message of Jesus who has come to die. So, um, yeah, this, again, we've said in Mark, he commanded the demons to be silent. And we talked about that, of Satan's not going to be a messenger of the gospel. People are going to be. So you, you shut up the, all of the, the demons because they, they, don't, they don't get to tell this story. Um, it's God's people's story to tell. This is the first instance of telling a person to, to cool it. And again, very specifically, he didn't tell this person never to say anything. He says, first, mm -hmm. go to the priest. Yeah. That, that's the first step. Um, and again, that was in, in line with the, um, the Mosaic law. So number one, he's, he wasn't telling the person to disobey that. He was, you know, still do that. But two, it, it would be a testimony, a proof to those priests of some, something's going on here. Um, because again, what are the priests supposed to do? They're, they're supposed to be mediators and serve God. But Jesus is now the mediator because he's God and man in one. Pri priests aren't that. They're, they're just a sinful representative that God chooses. Um, so we have that. And then um, I, don't tell everybody yet. It, it, gave, it would have given Jesus more distance and time to continue to do what he wanted to do, which was to go to these surrounding villages. But now, what was the result? He couldn't go to the cities openly anymore. Um, once people got word of him, 
it's 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 all over. So Jesus had specific things he wanted to do, and in in a sense, this this prevents him from doing that. Now, obviously, we know in the big picture, Jesus knows everything. He he, he knows that this man is going to gonna say stuff. Um, he knows it it's gonna get in his way, but he, he's still able to do what he wants to do. Now, if Jesus was doing that today, mm-hmm. think of the crowds he he attract. Yeah, well, I mean, Some for and a lot of them against. Yeah, the, it, yeah. Jesus came in the fullness of time, yeah. and uh, if if he came today, like against like social media, can you imagine um, the 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 word and things going viral and whatnot, and how quickly the message would get misconstrued? Oh yeah. Um, so uh, he he came at he came at a time when none of that stuff existed, and yet he, he came in the in the time of the Roman empire where uh the road system so that paul and and the the missionaries could travel um to you know all parts of the the world at at that time um that they that they knew about and um so there there was communication but not too much communication which might be the problem today um okay so we we kind of covered that the last thing I wanted to remark about this is on your handout. Um, it's it's this it's a passage from Isaiah. So it's the last page of your handout. So it's remarking again on this: show yourself to the priest and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded. And so again, it says this is all part of Leviticus 14. Um, about halfway through that paragraph, it says the series of sacrifices offered included the shedding of blood and the sprinkling of that blood on the now healed person. Um, do you not have the right sheet, Joan? You're looking... No, I don't. Okay, slide, slide that one to her. This is the, the 2.0 version of that handout, so maybe you're looking at the 1.0 version. I'm looking at 1.0. Yeah, so it's on the back page. It's about halfway through that paragraph. The series of sacrifices offered, including the shedding of blood and the sprinkling of that blood on the now healed person. Again, you can see the, the foreshadowing here. This is all in that Levitical law, and you know we, we look at it and it's like, it's all so barbaric and whatnot, but Jesus' death, and the shedding of his blood, and and he talks about that. His blood makes us clean. His blood washes us clean, not just from physical impurity, but from that spiritual sickness of sin itself. Um, So all of those laws, we're we're looking forward to them. Um, Continuing, Jesus doesn't completely disregard the Levitical laws. Here he tells the man to go and fulfill them, but he doesn't follow them either. He doesn't give a diagnosis of this man's leprosy like a priest would, but instead it's by his touch and his word that he heals them. And yet it's more than that. Jesus takes on this man's leprosy through his contact with him. So again, those Levitical rules, you don't touch the sick people. You don't come into contact with them. And if you do, you become as ritually unclean as as all of those people do. Jesus breaks all of those rules because he touches this man. That the logic is that that should therefore make Jesus unclean. And yet what actually happens is that man becomes clean. Jesus doesn't all of a sudden come down with leprosy though, but but in a sense, he is taking on this man's sickness. Um, so... Here's the catch. So Jesus takes on this man's leprosy through his contact with him, um, symbolically. Okay, symbolically. In doing so, Jesus fulfills the Old Testament prophecies that he would be stricken. Okay, so here's this from Isaiah 53, verse 4. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken smitten by God and afflicted. You know that that hymn from the Lenten season, stricken, smitten, and afflicted? So I didn't catch this until I I was doing a little bit of work. The word stricken that I've bolded and underlined 
is the same word that is used in Leviticus 13 for one who has leprosy. So in the English translation, it'll say a person is diagnosed as infected with leprosy. And I think that word infected is because that's, that's our medical, when we say somebody gets sick, we say they're infected with disease. But in Hebrew, the word is they're stricken with leprosy, okay? So the same word that's used in Isaiah that we esteemed him stricken, it, it is, is a word that people in that day would, would, would use like, it, it means that Jesus has a disease. Uh, it would be better if this word was infected uh, in English because then the parallel would be there. And so that's the prophecy in Isaiah, that the Jesus would be infected with sin and sickness. Well, how does one get infected with sin and sickness? By coming okay. into contact with it. Uh, again, it is, it is just this, this beautiful prophecy of the incarnation, right? You, you cannot get sick unless you are flesh and blood, <laughs> you know? A, a spirit's not gonna get a cold. A, a spirit's not gonna get sick. But Jesus, the incarnation, takes on our humanity and takes on all of it. The sicknesses, the afflictions, the, the grief, the sorrows, he takes it all on, okay? Um, and this prophecy says that people see all of this. The next verse, he was pierced for our transgressions. Gosh, that's talking about the cross, isn't it? Not only are his hands and feet pierced, but his side is pierced by the, um, uh, the soldier's spear. He was crushed for our iniquities. So transgressions and iniquities are two synonymous words for sin, right? The, the ways that we have broken the, the Old Testament laws, the ways that we have broken God's um, commandments. Upon him was the chastisement so that's, that's like the punishment mm -hmm. that brought us peace. And with his wounds, or, or by his wounds, that's the more familiar translation, with his wounds, we are healed. Okay, this is all Isaiah. This is written like 600 BC, be before Jesus. Where in the world does Isaiah get any of this? Yeah. Um, but God, God gives him these words. And whether or not Isaiah understands them, he knows the people need to know these words. So, Bob, if everybody was looking for this type of Messiah, Jesus would have no problem of saying, yep, he's come, he's come. But they're not going to talk about this type of Messiah. Instead, they're going to say, this guy heals diseases. This guy's wonderful. He's like a medicine cabinet, right? But in, in healing these people he was taking on all of their sickness, all of their disease, and all of that he would take on, but would give us peace and healing. Peace and healing. So the thing that should astound us in this case of leprosy is not Jesus's scientific magic that somehow he has a cure to a, a physical, scientific, medical disease. <clears throat> what we're supposed to see is this much bigger picture where sin is connected with sickness. And Jesus, just as he bears our sins on the cross, he also has taken on all of the, the sicknesses and illnesses, all of the stigmas attached to them. He's gonna be the one that's cast out. Who, who gets cast out in the Old Testament? The unclean. The, the, the sinners, the blasphemers, Jesus will take on all, all of that guilt. It's not his, but he will take all of that on in order to bring healing to those that truly are sick. Um, and, and it's right there. So uh, Isaiah 53, and, and all of this is, is, a, is a great prophecy of Jesus. Um, he, he does it all. So I, it was just that... I've never, I've never understood, I, I know that hymn, stricken, smitten, and afflicted, I, it's, it's a very good Lenten hymn, 
And I had never made the connection before that that word stricken is, is basically like referring to the sicknesses. And here, leprosy specifically. Um, so the other connection with this word stricken, the words in Exodus for the plagues, it's the same word that God strikes them. So they're stricken. And what were they stricken with? All of these plagues, these physical problems. Sometimes they were creation. Creation was kind of in rebellion against them. You know, there was darkness. But sometimes there were these physical things that happened to them. And in, in Hebrew, it's the same word, that they were stricken by God. Um, so this is, it's just, it's, it's cool to make all of these, these connections. Um, and uh, I, I didn't make that connection before. So I'm sharing my own personal discovery as I do this. I'm, I, I don't have all of the answers. I discover new things all the time because I need to keep reading and, and learning things. But um, the, the, the cool thing here is Jesus justifies all of us. Um, he makes the sacrifice. He makes the intercessions. He does everything that's necessary. Um, for this man, but but for us too. Any thoughts, questions on your your part? Profound. It it's mm -hmm. deep stuff. It's deep. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Yeah, and again, it's this is this is Christmas. That why why does Jesus have to be a baby? Why does he have to be one of us? Because he cannot do those things if if he if he if he were not a human. Yeah. Um, you wonder why little children are stricken. You know? mm -hmm. it, it's it doesn't seem fair to them mm -hmm. because they are, as far as I know, little mm -hmm. babies are without sin. Mm -hmm. you know? yeah. No, no, yeah, that that that, that not. that's not a correct theological reading, Bob. I know, I know. Um, yeah, because we're we're all born and we all die. I and, guess they they're not a, they don't have yeah. the ability to show they're sinful. Well, that's not true either. You haven't had a baby around for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> How um, are they showing? Uh, they 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 can only think about themselves. I mean, you would say that's a biological necessity, but. It, they don't realize it. That. It, it, it isn't because God is God has given them parents that that, that take care of them, yeah. Um, and yeah. So I mean that that's just that's, it's a small example, but uh, doctrinally, there, there's two ways to talk about sin. There's original sin, which is we are all born sinners. If if there was the possibility, Bob, that a child was born without sin, and Therefore, Jesus would be unnecessary to the story because while, while it might be difficult, it's theoretically possible that child could be the one to fulfill all righteousness and, and save us. If, if a person could do that, um, and Jesus is the one, but Jesus comes in a different way. Jesus is conceived by the Holy Spirit. So he is free from that original sin. So that's, that's one challenge to that. Um, original sin is what we all inherit. Actual sin are like the sins that we commit. commit ourselves. Jesus died for both of those, and both of those are completely forgiven. There's some Roman Catholic theology, you know, ar argues a little bit about that. Um, but both of those condemn us original sin and our actual sin again just one sin is enough to send us to hell i think the reason i said that was that what's going on in israel right now in mm -hmm. gaza with hamas mm -hmm. you know, beheading little babies mm -hmm. you know, throwing them in ovens yeah now, it's I mean, it's I, absolutely abhorrent oh, and mm -hmm. they're, they're without sin as they're innocent bystanders innocent, in innocent in this people, war. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's absolutely true. And again, people ask Jesus those questions too. Of you know, this tower fell and it killed a bunch of people. Yeah. What you know, what what, what great sin did they do? And yeah. and Jesus didn't say that they committed a great sin. He just says, repent because you it could happen to you too. 
And so Jesus's concern is not to not to connect all of the dots of why of causation and why this happens, but you you do know then that that our only hope is Jesus. He who is out sin has to Because become. again, you know, you it, you think back to your son, I'm sure a lot. He he was innocent in his death. It was somebody else that caused that. Yeah. What what did your son your son didn't do anything. Um that's not right. It isn't. But but sin doesn't follow the rules. Sin breaks all of those rules of it's, right and wrong. And and therefore it, the world is a scary place. So what could be our only hope and comfort? It's it has to be Jesus. Um it has to be Jesus. Well, a lot of people throughout the world mm -hmm. in our towns and mm -hmm. our villages and mm -hmm. that stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. They don't care mm -hmm. about anybody or mm -hmm. anything they care about themselves you know yeah and jesus who is he yeah yep sin 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 doesn't care satan doesn't care yeah. and in some ways the more pain that they can inflict they take pleasure in oh, that yeah. and enjoy they that like that yeah was it only uh, like three years that jesus actually preached his, his preaching ministry uh was around three years the and what i can't understand is how one person mm -hmm in three years mm -hmm. has lived forever. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's another confirmation to mm -hmm. me that mm -hmm. it's true. Mm -hmm. And when he was a young child, he was in the temple teaching the elders there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. They they were in awe of his wisdom. Yeah. Um, and the other thing that we, we just can't comprehend is God's life is eternity. And we're such a little minute, little speck, mm -hmm. speck mm -hmm. of that eternity mm -hmm. that we can't even begin to get the whole picture of yep. what is in the future. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep, that God, God always was, always is, always will be. We can say that, but we have no idea what that means because it, it's, it's yeah. yeah. Sometimes it's almost scary uh, knowing that you're going to die, but you know, you're going to go to heaven, mm -hmm. at least we think we are. Mm -hmm. But it's got to still have a little question mark. Geez, I committed all these sins while I was alive. You know, all of these sins. Does God keep a record? No, he throws them away. Mm -hmm. You know, they're gone. But sometimes I think about that, you know. Are you going to remember when I did this on such and such a date? No, nope, otherwise it's not forgiveness. Yeah, yeah the, the, debts, the debts are canceled. It's gone. Yeah. We we have we have a hard time with rem like yeah forgetfulness. How can God forget? And it it's in the Bible multiple different times, multiple different ways. As far as the east is from the west, from the west yeah. Um, yeah. All right, so I'm gonna I'm gonna move on. The next handout, the the end passage sort of connects to this, but we are we, all, we also said it is the result of this particular healing, the act of cleansing the leper. Uh, was that Jesus could no longer go around um, to these villages the way that he wanted to. Um, but he, he is not deterred. He still goes around. He just has to hang out in kind of the, the desolate places, the, the places away from the crowd, because otherwise he wouldn't um, get about that, that business that he wanted to do. Okay, chapter 2 starts a, a new a new chapter. Um, it, it begins with, and when he returned to Capernaum after some days. So between the last story and this, like I said, it starts a new chapter. Some time has passed. It's undefined how much time has passed. Some amount of time. Well, what has happened between that healing of the leper and this next story? Jesus was going around preaching. He was going around telling other people about the kingdom of God, but um, he was he was always on the move. He wasn't really staying at one particular place. He was just always on the move. But now he goes back to Capernaum, which was where this sort of all began. Um, Capernaum was the site of Jesus in the synagogue and the um, man with the demon cries out and Jesus silences the demon, casts out the demon, and then everybody's amazed and says, wow, this guy teaches like he has authority. 
Uh, he teaches like nobody else that we've ever heard or seen. And then that's a Sabbath. He's at the synagogue. That's where all of that happens. He goes back to Simon's home. He heals his mother-in-law who's sick. That we said was already a, a, an instance of Jesus going into a sick person. And, and so he kind of like already is, is breaking the rules. But the difference between touching a person with a fever and touching somebody with leprosy is, is a big difference. I mean, the Old Testament is very clear and explicit on, on leprosy. Sickness, it, it's just sort of common sense of you don't, you don't go into contact with sick people because you know that they're not well. Leprosy was you do not come into any contact with them because you will be unclean and you will have to join them. Um, so it was the, the story of him touching Simon's mother-in-law was a little taste of the much bigger transgression that would come in the healing of the leper. Um, after he healed Jesus, uh, Simon's mother-in-law, what did we hear about? There were all of a sudden sick people that are brought outside the front door and, and he heals them. And then he says, you know, I got to preach. I got to preach. He starts to do that. He starts to go to the villages and that's when he encounters this leper and then what he wanted to do was continue what he was trying to do in the first place was to go and preach. Um, but he couldn't do it because he, he was kind of overcome. So he's back in Capernaum and Capernaum seems to be like the little mini headquarters um, where, where Jesus was. It isn't exactly clear who Jesus is staying with, uh, if, he's, if he has a house or an apartment or something that, that he rents. Like, there's, there's not a lot of detail here. So, um, but what it does say is when he returns to Capernaum, he was at home. Like, he was no longer just going from one place to the next. This was some kind of, I, I'm back where I've begun again. Um, so that's just kind of interesting, just as we think about Jesus's biography. Um, we know Joseph was from Nazareth. He had to go to Bethlehem because of that census. That's where Jesus was born. Um, at some point in time, they flee to Egypt because King Herod hears about Jesus and the king is born and he doesn't like that. Um, the timeline on those events is really unclear. Um, we generally say that, that the, the Magi came not to the same place where Jesus was born, because we know that that was a manger. Matthew's gospel specifically says the Magi came to a house. So we don't, okay, when, when did they, when, where is this house? What, you know, what, what happened um, between the manger and the house? We, we don't really know. What we do know is that King Herod says all male babies two years and under are supposed to die. And the reason why two years and under is because he talks to the Magi about when did the star appear and two years. So um, Jesus could have been an, a toddler, a, you know, a two-year-old when the Magi came. We don't know for sure, um, but it does seem that the Magi shouldn't be in the manger scene. That we 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 kind of quash those stories together. All the manger um, scenes are. I know, right? Yeah. So the coming of the Magi in the church calendar is the day of Epiphany. So Christmas Day is the twenty fifth. And then we say there are 12 days of Christmas. You know this song. The 12 days of Christmas refer not to the 12 days before Christmas, but starting with Christmas, the 12 days that follow, and the 13th day is the day of Epiphany. And Epiphany is when, again, we observe that the wise men, the Magi, come. Um, but 
when all of that happens, it, it just kind of – the timeline all gets mashed, mashed together. Uh, is, is it a huge deal? Are we going to go to hell because we put the Magi in the, in the manger scene? No. Um, but if you want to be factually accurate, uh, it, it does not seem that the Magi belong there uh, at the same time, at the same place. Why did I bring all of that up? Uh, because I was talking about the biography of Jesus. So Jesus is born in the manger. At some point in time, Mary and Joseph are in a home. That's when the Magi come. Still seems to be in Bethlehem because that's where they were supposed to go. But it, it says they followed the star. So the star could have directed them someplace else. Then when Herod makes that decree, what do they do? They go to Egypt. Okay. And then at some point in time, the angel lets Joseph know uh, King Herod has died. He's no longer after, after baby Jesus because he's no longer there. Uh, of course, there's a new king in charge, but um, time has passed. And then Mary and Joseph and Jesus go to Nazareth, and that's where he grows up. At some point in time, Capernaum also seems to be a home for Jesus, so people refer to him as from Nazareth. That's, that's his hometown as far as people are concerned. But Capernaum has something to do with him. Nazareth was a very small town, and it could be because Joseph was a carpenter, um, worked a trade. In order to stay alive, in order to have business, you, you kind of have to go where the business is. Capernaum was a bigger city. So, you know, maybe... Nazareth was the hometown, but Joseph went to Capernaum and kind of introduced Jesus there, too. Um, we don't really know, but Capernaum becomes a city associated with Jesus's life, too. Um, we know in his ministry, he talks about himself as like, um, he says, birds have nests, foxes have dens, but the Son of Man has nowhere to, to lay his head. He's just always sort of on the go. On today's um, map, where is Capernaum? So, um, Dead Sea, Jordan River skates up north of it, um, and the Sea of Galilee is that small lake yeah. sea at the top. Capernaum is on the north, northwest oh, side of it. Um, it's about 70, 70, 80 miles from Jerusalem, north, north of, north of Jerusalem. Yep. From Nazareth? Uh, from Nazareth, it's, oh, gosh... Maybe 10, 15 miles. It's, it's not very far from Nazareth. Nazareth is south and west of Capernaum. Um, yeah. But still on the west side of the Yeah, Rocky yeah. Um, that, that let's see if I have my easy, hand. Easily done train. I mean, could, yes, yeah. You could go 10 miles in those days. Yeah. You, you, and, and they have roads, really roads cool. for this and everything. Um, it is not... Um, yeah. So this this scale, where's the a thumb is about ten miles, it says, and Nazareth is here, Capernaum is there, so maybe it's a little over ten miles. Um, but there's the Sea of Galilee, Jordan River, um, Jerusalem is down here. Uh, why aren't you standing out, Jerusalem? I see Jericho. Jerusalem, there we go. There's too many other cities by it. Uh, Jerusalem is, is way down there. So, again, we don't hear a lot about Nazareth. In the other Gospels, we sort of get an idea of, well, why else is Capernaum his, his sort of seat of operation? When he does speak in Nazareth, they reject him. And, and part of Jesus' mission and ministry, he, he gave this to the disciples as well, and he seems to follow it. If they reject you, mm -hmm. shake, shake the dust off your feet, go to the next place. Um, so, yeah. All right. So Capernaum is the setting for this great story. Um, he returned to Capernaum. It was reported that he was at home. In other words, they're waiting for him. They, they again... They, they've experienced him already. He's the one that kind of went away from them in Capernaum, and they're glad to have him back. Why? Because he can heal people. He can heal people. Let, let's bring some more sick people to him. Mm -hmm. There's so many more people that need to experience um, this healing. So 
That's one of the big motivations, and that sets off this story. The other is that what ha what else has he said that he wanted to do? He wants to preach. Yeah. So people want, what does this guy have to say? Yeah. Um, again, he he preached in a way that no one else did. If if nothing else, people are fascinated by him. And let let's hear a little bit more what from this guy. Um, you know, I, I'm not sure what to make of him. I. I've said the, the point of Matt, Mark's gospel thus far is it wants, it wants you to be asking the question, who is this Jesus? Well, you can't know who he is unless you continue to hear more about him. You know, 2,000 years have gone by since mm -hmm. Jesus did that. Mm -hmm. Was there? People haven't changed. They're the same right now. Human, human nature. If he was alive right now, you know, mm -hmm. bring mm -hmm. all of our sick. Yep. Know? Yep. <laughs> yeah. So verse 2 says the obvious. Uh, once they hear that he's home, what happens? Many were gathered together so that there was no more room, not even at the door, that is of the house that he's staying at. So just like with Simon's mother-in-law, uh, they bring the sick right up to the door. Th they do that here too. But this time, Mark adds this detail. He's like, there isn't even any room at the door anymore. Um, you really can't move. That's how much the crowd is there. What's Jesus' focus? He was, he was preaching the word to them. His first focus isn't the healing. And again, that seems weird to us because the great miracle is the healing. But his word is God's word. His word is powerful. His word does the healing. And so we sometimes want to elevate the action and denigrate the word. And Jesus keeps trying to do the opposite. Um, it's because the word is preached that healing follows. Well, if you go to the hospital and you're healed, mm -hmm. you're sick, mm -hmm. and you're healed, you go home right away. Mm -hmm. You don't sit around and listen to the rest of this. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that, I mean, there's that mm -hmm. tied into it. Too. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're drawn. He needs to get the message, mm -hmm. not just the healing. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. So the scene is set. He's back home. Everybody knows about it. And they just have overwhelmed that house that he's at. So verse three, and they came, um, who bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. Uh, so it's, it's sort of an undescribed group of pre people who these, they are, but at least among them is a paralytic a paralyzed man, a man who cannot walk, and on on a mattress or a cot or something, uh, and then a guy at every every corner. So carried by four men. Okay, so I'm sure again, in 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 this great crowd, there were a lot of different sick people, a lot of different diseases. Mark is focusing our attention on this particular group. Why? When they could not. Uh, when they could not get near him because of the crowd, okay, we just established that, like, there, there's nowhere you're going to get carrying a, a sick man anywhere near Jesus. Um, excuse me, excuse, no, they have their own sick. They're trying to get to Jesus. They're not going to let you through. Um, so what do they do? They removed the roof above him. So Jesus is in a house. The house has a roof, and they remove the roof. So the the houses of that day, we kind of have to in, make inferences. We have archaeology, and archaeology has like the the footprints of a house. But guess what? A roof of a house is not going to survive two thousand years. When when a place is destroyed, they completely level it. The only thing that's left is like the outline of the building. They don't they don't necessarily dig up all the foundation stones of a building. So um, we don't necessarily have a, an intact roof. But what we can surmise based on you know some of the evidence and other descriptions, um, the the roofs in this area would not have been um, stone shingle roofs or anything. They'd be more like uh, the, the tiki lounges at some of our places by the lake, Thatch, thatching. You know, you have the framework, which is, which is wood, but then you put, you know, 
different layers of, of branches uh, and uh, you can even have sod, um, you know, so it's, it's something that's, it's a solid surface. It's, it's not really going to leak, but to, to remove it, you, you would have to kind of dig a hole and, and dig it apart, which is quite a scene because there are people <laughs> crowded around yeah. below. They're going to, they're going to be noticing and feeling this. You kind of wonder in a, in a comedic sense, like, how long is Jesus going to go on until it's like, <clears throat> you're going to do, do something about that? They're destroying your home um, by digging into the roof. But all of this is motivated by the fact that they really, really, really want to get this man, this paralyzed man to Jesus. There, there's no other way. Um, so they're taking quite a, quite a challenging approach to it. Um, and also, I kind of wonder how how long did would it have taken them to remove a big enough section to what they're going to do lower down this this paralytic on the on the mat? Um, again, it, it didn't just immediately happen. Okay, so they're determined. They remove the roof above him. That's verse four and a half. Uh, and when they had made an opening. They let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. Okay, so that's how you get to Jesus. You, you can't get to him from the side, so you get to him from above. And now, finally, Jesus is going to acknowledge the situation. And how does what is the first thing that he sees? When Jesus saw their faith. Okay, what's going on there? Whose faith is he talking about? The four men. Okay. Or the paralytic. Okay. Whoever's faith he's talking about, it's it's more than one person. It, he doesn't say he saw his faith. It says their faith. Um, I, I guess we're left with two options, and I honestly don't know which which is right. I kind of think both. Um, can, you can make a case for both, which I'm probably going to lean to the latter. So their faith could be simply the four men who... Have, have this great faith in Jesus of, if we can just get you to Jesus, he'll take care of the rest, okay? So it clearly refers to them. The question is, what about that paralyzed man? Is he included in that? Was any of this his idea, you know? I mean, he, he's putting his own life into these people's hands too. Um, this is not a, a very safe thing, to be brought up onto a roof when you're paralyzed. I mean, if they don't, if somebody wow. slips, you're gonna fall on your noggin and die probably, right? Um, but but it's worth it. It's worth it to this paralyzed man too. So, so that's the other option, that their faith is not just the four, but also the fifth, this paralyzed man. And I, I, as I said, I could see it go either way, but if I say it can go either way, I think I think I would say it's referring to all of them. Because it could have been family members, mm -hmm. it could have been his brothers, yeah. or it could have been their father. Yeah. And they had heard Jesus preaching yeah. and what they had seen from lepers and other cripples. Yeah. That their faith said, We gotta get our dad down there, mm -hmm. or our brother. Mm -hmm. So yeah. they were very determined. Yeah. But it it whosoever's faith we ultimately would say it is the object of that faith is crystal clear to me it's if we just do this if we just get this man to jesus we know that jesus can can remedy this situation okay so jesus sees that and so it says he said to the paralytic son your sins are forgiven so the interesting thing here is he sees all of these people doing this, but he speaks to the paralytic and to him alone and says, son, your sins are forgiven. And everybody's like, Jesus, they didn't bring this guy here because he sinned. They brought him here because he's paralyzed. We all know. We all know what you're supposed to do. Like, are you stupid, Jesus? Um, that's that's what our immediate reaction is. But again, put yourself into their world. Sin and sickness are 
are so closely connected. So when Jesus talks about this man's sin and now his sin is forgiven, that is opening the door to the healing that, that can follow. I will say, though, Jesus apparently has previously healed other people without any reference at all to their sin. So he can heal people without saying something like, your sins are forgiven. Jesus is choosing his words and his actions very carefully, and, and he knows how this is going to be perceived. So my caution is just, we would say, okay, they, they bring the paralytic to him, and the first thing out of Jesus' mouth is, your sins are forgiven. Jesus is clueless. The caution is, we're clueless, because we're looking at this from a medical perspective, um, this man has paralysis because of, you know, n nerve damage or something um, in his vertebrae. That's the real problem here. Jesus would say, no, you don't get it. None of this is a part of the plan. All of this is because of sin. So the real solution we need is not to fix his vertebrae. It's what's the answer to sin? Jesus speaks to the most important thing. If we miss that, it's not Jesus who's stupid. We're the ones missing the point. Okay. Um, son, your sins are forgiven. Here's where it gets interesting. Now, some of the scribes were sitting there. This is the second time in Mark's gospel that scribes have come up. The first time was back in the synagogue, that first time that Jesus is teaching, preaching. And Jesus is compared by the people with the scribes. And the comparison is Jesus doesn't teach like the scribes teach. Jesus teaches with authority. So what's a scribe? A scribe is an expert in the Mosaic law, the written word. So they're called scribes because they're the ones that know the written word. And the best way to know the written word is to, to copy it, to write, to write down the Mosaic law for themselves. They have their own copy then, and they can study it, they can read it, you know, they can know the ins and outs. They're like the, the Google and the Wikipedia of their day of the Bible. The people don't, the everyday ordinary people, they don't have in their hands the Bible. That's why they go to the synagogue, so they can get God's word. The scribes are the little miniature walking versions of that, the mobile app, if you will. Um, and so that's their job, to know the Mosaic Law. So they know God's word, and this is causing them a great deal of discomfort. Wait a second, Jesus, you, don't, you can't forgive sins. That, that is God's, and God, God alone does that. Now the priests do it on God's behalf, but, but you're not a priest, and you're not speaking in that capacity. So there, there is a problem here. What it sounds to the scribes like Jesus is doing is he is speaking for God, and that's blasphemy if you don't actually have that authority. You're standing in God's place speaking for God, and if you don't have that permission and you don't have that authority, that's blasphemy. And again, these guys know the Old Testament. If you blaspheme God, you are stoned to death. The penalty for that is death. The other question that we have is, what are these guys even doing here? Yeah, that's what I question. Yeah. Everybody else, you know, that's come for Jesus, they're come because they want, you know, somebody to be healed. These guys seem to have an agenda. It's, it's almost like they're on the lookout for Jesus to say something wrong, and then here they come and say, that's not what it says in God's word. And, and that's exactly how the scribes are going to function in the rest of the gospel. Um, here is their first entrance, and from the get-go, they're against Jesus. They they do not like what he's saying. They do not like what he's doing. Um, and the problem is not that Jesus is wrong. The problem is that they're wrong. 
So those that oppose Jesus are the ones that the people were looking to to bring them God's word. And that's, that's one of the great tragedies of all of this. Okay, we got to stop there, I believe. Um, we'll get to the, the conflict as it develops. But, but here it is. Jesus heal, uh, forgives, rather, forgives this paralytic. And scribes are there and hear those words of forgiveness and say, Them, them's fighting words. And, and we're going to nail you on it, Jesus. But Jesus has the trump on them because he actually is speaking on God's behalf because he is God. Um, And he actually has that authority. And what's more, he will then heal this man. And that that's the real Trump. Um, Because as we'll talk about, well, I mean, on the surface, anybody could say sins are forgiven. How do we know? We can't we can't see their spiritual scorecard. We don't know if that those words actually mean anything or not. Um, but I know that guy can't walk and I know that, that he doesn't have that ability, but if you say that he can, now we can all prove you wrong because he can't do that. We all know it, except he can, he will. And that's to get them to rethink the part that they can't see, which, which is, which is harder to do to forgive sins or to say to a paralyzed man, get up and walk. That's Jesus' challenge to these guys. All right. On that note, let's, uh, let's close in prayer. Dear Jesus, your word is powerful because you are God and you speak God's word. And what a great word that is for us because uh, we look to your word as a word of forgiveness. Uh, we are not perfect. We do not follow God's word as as well as we should. Um, and there's punishment for that. And yet, Lord, you were the one that took that punishment for us. You took that punishment upon yourself so that you could speak to us that word of forgiveness and that word of healing. And it really does forgive. It really does heal. And, and even today, in a, in a world where we see sicknesses and death, uh, remind us that, that those things don't have the final word. Rather, your word is the, the word of eternal life. Your word resurrects the dead and one day will, will resurrect us too. We thank you for that power. And we pray, Lord, that we would trust in it, that we would hold to that word so that nothing else in this word, world could ever cause us fear, cause us doubt, or cause us to turn away because we have your beautiful and wonderful word spoken to us. And this is the word that we believe. In Jesus' name, amen.